Larry Lala here. Um, and I'm, this is the live webinar. I'm going to pick up where I left off earlier with some of the YouTube videos. Uh, so let's do a super, super fast recap. Uh, remember that when you start law school, there are these kind of three primary sources of stress. Um, uh, the kind of piles of reading that you've got to do, the other students, uh, and your professors. The combination of them usually results in peer pressure to overwork at what I regard to be the wrong things. Uh, you end up being boxer from Animal Farm, uh, and you end up focusing on one of these three pretty normal coping strategies with law school. Either you end up reading and rereading cases ad nauseum, you either end up creating work product to try to grapple with the cases, or you end up kind of talking it out in study groups. Uh, either way, I think this results in not, um, not entirely happy outcomes. Um, so one of the things I asked at the end of the last video is, to ask yourself why you're doing this. Now, a lot of you, this is a couple of weeks before law school starts. Um, it, so you have to imagine yourself in another month or so. Um, and, and the reason that I spent so much time trying to describe um, what those pressures were like uh, is that you will very easily find yourself falling into the trap of engaging in one of those activities. Uh, as a response to stress, uh, that, that you feel uh, that you're being productive and that that kind of action, whether you know what you're doing and why you're doing it or not, feels better than doing nothing. Uh, but the core question underlying this is whether kind of feeling productive is really the same as, as being productive in terms of getting good law school outcomes. I keep coming back to this. This stick of public humiliation is really huge for law students. All of us fear public speaking and being uh, made idiots in front of a group of people who are literally our intellectual peers. Um, so I told you what not to do. Uh, so again, what, what should you be doing then? So I think there are a couple of things to do. Uh, if you've if you're totally new uh, to my materials, this will be new. If, if uh, you're not, I'm trying to take a different angle at some of the things that I've described before. Uh, so I want to talk about how to read cases, uh, why to read cases, uh, you know, what it is exactly that you're looking for, and then the shortcut to preparing for, uh, for class. It's not the complete answer because there's, there's a longer, um, there's a kind of bigger picture than just the cases. Um, and I'll get to that, begin to touch on that at the very end. Uh, so I've kind of denigrated the process of really trying to understand the cases that you're reading. Uh, so maybe the question arises, you know, should I really read the cases or what should I get out of reading the cases? And these are real questions that I've gotten from students. Uh, this is, some of these are from last year. Um, but these are people who are uh, already in law school and, um, you know, these are people who wrote in like September or October and they're just treading water. They're trying to cope with the workload. Um, I mean, this person is, I'm usually studying in between classes every evening and 48 hours on the weekends in order to do all the reading and the assignments. And, you know, this person's not even briefing cases. Um, so these are all samples. But I think one of the students answered her own question. The main way I could reduce the reading is by looking at case summaries. The cases aren't usually the long assignments and skipping, skimming theory and descriptive stuff in the textbooks. Um, so one of the things is to note um, when you get to law school, the, the effect that um, 
both peer and kind of professorial professor uh, professorial pressure are exerting on you uh, to do what everyone else is doing to frantically read the cases to brief cases that there's some magic in having mastered all the details of the cases that'll help you do well um, I'm not going to belabor this but some of this is to actually feel the stress to, to know that it's not just in your head but it's a physical reaction um, but also the mental part of it, the more intellectual part of it, is can you really articulate to yourself clearly why reading cases is that important other than the fact that it's, you know, the only material that you're given? Um, can, can those who are telling you to do this, your peers, maybe two wells or professors actually tell you why you're doing this? So I think there's a way to think about reading cases. Um, one part of it uh, is the 80-20 rule or the, the Pareto principle, which is to say this idea, which, which isn't a theory, it comes from apparently, it actually started with Gregor Mendel uh, with his little, the monk with his little plot of peas, the guy who gave us kind of modern the start of modern genetics, sorry, I didn't major in biology. But it's the basic observation that this is kind of the power rule. 80% of outputs come from 20% of inputs. Um, and there are more extreme versions of this, meaning that this end of it, the outputs end up being higher. You know, 80% of results come from 20% of effort, 20% of people own 80% of the wealth, etc. So there's something here that 80% of the output of the work that you do with cases is really coming from 20% of your inputs. So maybe there's a place once you learn what's really important to kind of cut down on your studying. Uh, so the really general form of this is to identify the few things that you do that will really give you the most output. Not all study activities are equally important. Um, some are not important at all. And it's my feeling that law professors actively mislead you on this. Um, it's active, whether or not it's intentional is another matter. Uh, Tim Ferriss is the four hour work week guy, by the way. Um, the other half of this is Parkinson's law. So, um, which is not, it's not really a law. It was originally a kind of parody written by a British civil servant. Uh, and it's the idea that work will kind of fill all the hours you allocate to it. Um, so the, the kind of insight here is to use Parkinson's law to artificially compress the time that it takes to do something. You'll get it done fast if you absolutely have to get it. And, you know, we've done this in the context of cramming in college. I mean, you're stuck the last minute and somehow you manage to do everything that you need to do and get the A or a decent grade. Uh, the difference here is that you're going to choose to do this deliberately in advance. Uh, but the thing to note is that you really have to decide to do this. You, you have to choose this delibery, deliberately. It's a strategy. Um, you have to decide that despite the pressure that you're going to face to kind of read till you drop, write till you drop, or talk till you drop, that you're going to commit to doing the truly important things uh, to get a good outcome in law school and not worry about the less important things even if those around you are kind of losing their heads. The other choice that you can make, which is the default choice, is just to do what everyone else does, which is the, the current's gonna pull you along or it's more of a riptide. Um, not choosing is kind of the choice. You're gonna get the default, you're gonna do lots of reading, you're not going to practice the things that matter. I'm not really going to talk about issue spotting this time. And you're going to end up with kind of middle of the pack grades. Okay, so there's the mental game, understanding the pressures that you're going to be under. It's what I've spent a lot of time discussing in the last two videos. The 80-20 rule to realize that there are certain things to focus on that are going to give you most of the output uh, from studying. And then to try to squeeze uh, the important tasks in a limited amount of time. The point of this is not to kind of free up time and to drink heavily afterwards. You can do that if you want to, 
the ultimate end game of this is to free up time to focus on other things that matter. Um, I'm not suggesting that you slack off in law school. Everyone is going to work hard. The question is what you spend your time working hard at. Um, so this is kind of a preview. I didn't mean to have this slide here, but there's a way uh, to get to the core of what's important in cases very easily. Let's, let's take a step back. Why is it that you're going to read these cases? I mean, what is it that you're supposed to get from reading? To me, it's kind of two things. I'm going to talk about these things now, even if they don't make sense now, uh, because as you work and as, as we talk about some of the things that I'm going to mention later, like say next week, you'll understand why these things are important. One reason you need to, to read cases is to develop a rule of general application. I'll describe what that means later. The second is to get fact hooks. Sorry. Uh, you can call the rule of general application the RGA. Um, I love kind of giving people mental images. So you've got RZA for the RGA. And you've got Maui. I don't know how many of you have kids that were forced to watch Moana, but this is Maui and this is his fact hook. So one of the key things in reading a case is to extract a rule of general application. Now, I realize this is extremely early. Some of you haven't even thought about what it means to get to be reading cases in law school. That's fine. Um, but Cases have holdings. It's the resolution of a particular issue that the parties are disputing. The resolution of that issue is the holding or how the case is resolved. But um, that's not the rule of general application. This is how the case is resolved. The rule of general application is a more generalized form of the rule that applies in future cases or more practically is applied by other courts um, to resolve new cases. This RGA is something that you need to get from a case to apply to new facts, which will appear to you on your final exam. Now, you can get it by trying to pull teeth, by reading the case yourself, by reading and rereading and rereading it a million times. Uh, I think you're even less likely to get it by briefing the case. Or you can simply get it from a commercial outline or a case brief. Um, these are usually paid products, um, and I'll discuss them later. They're valuable because they figured out what this rule is for you. And as you can tell by some of the text I've given you of actual cases, that it's not always super obvious. It doesn't jump out from the page what this more generalizable rule is. The other reason you read cases is to kind of have a fact trigger or a fact hook. Um, and some of this comes from the very human, I mean, it's in our wiring to think of things as stories, as narrative. Our mind isn't really built to remember aimless facts. It's really built to remember stories. Uh, so one way, the reason that you need these fact hooks in the future is they'll help you recall the rule of general application. You'll see something, it'll remind you of a case that you've read, um, but you'll only kind of get that trigger if you know what the case is about. Um, so how can you remember these things? Now, uh, let's flash forward a second to exams. Again, which I'm only talking about for the limited purpose of explaining to you what you need to get out of the readings. Um, the exam is a set of facts that you've never seen before and you need to apply law uh, to it to kind of figure out what claims and defenses parties will raise against each other and how to resolve them. Um, Certain facts that you read will hopefully jog your memory, but you need to have a memory to jog. Now, you need to not 
read the cases passively. I think this is one of the problems with the three deadly sins that I mentioned before. Reading till you drop, writing till you drop, creating case briefs, and even talking till you drop. These are fundamentally passive ways of learning. Um, again, it doesn't seem like it, especially in the case of briefing cases and you're talking, and, uh, talking them out because you're doing something, but you're not, you're, you're simply trying to embed the same materials in your head without really kind of adding anything else. What you need to do is some form of active reading in this context. So it's not just reading the case, but to test your own understanding by playing with the case in your head. And this is quite hard. So the process that you use in part, and this includes, you know, after having um, uh, pre-studied or side-studied the law with some other work product is um, th the way that you really get into active reading is to make your own hypos based on cases. So the way you do that is not just to read the case. You kind of, again, you get the rule of general application for maybe an outline or a case brief. Um, and then you think about what it would take to change a case to get a different outcome. What would have to be different? Um, just pushing it over the line. What would have pushed the court to make a different decision? And then to make up a different set of facts that would result in the same outcome, maybe in a different field or a parallel field as, as the subject matter of the case. Um, so there are multiple benefits of kind of making your own hypos. This is active learning. And when you kind of play with a case like this, it locks the case in your mind. Um, it's a way of developing a true understanding of the case. It's a way of beginning to practice hypotheticals and even anticipating exam questions that your uh, professor might come up with. They often come up with exam questions as from variations of cases. Um, now, don't let that thought lead you into thinking that if you memorize all the cases, you'll, you'll figure out uh, the right, you know, you'll predict exam questions. You won't um, because the facts will be different enough um, that it won't matter. But if you get into this habit of, of kind of thinking about what a case could mean, how can it be applied in the future, um, you're a lot better off. So there's more than just memorizing the case. It's mastering it and making it your own. So here's the shortcut. Pre-studying or side-studying the law. Um, I've done a lot of other videos on this topic. You can check my uh, uh, YouTube uh, page for that. Um, but you're not here to reinvent the wheel. Um, the rules of general application and the fact hooks are kind of out there already. You get commercial outlines. You get kind of these, the manuals law outlines. These run about 40 bucks a piece on Amazon. Or Gilbert's. Um, it's another brand. Um, or you can even use these. These are not really for sale. You tend to get these on eBay or Amazon's third-party uh, sales site. Um, that these are summaries, um, these, these are bar materials, Convisor mini reviews, a Barbary product. Um, and it's the super condensed outline um, for uh, studying for the bar. Uh, the cool thing is that they, it doesn't matter what state you get. Every state has the multi-state bar exam, except for one, I think. Uh, the basic six or seven subjects um, that you study your first year. It's the core of, of the bar exam. And you live in circular, circular time, you just come back to uh, the same spot. Um, any convisor would do, kind of older ones are fine. Another state is fine. Older ones are more expensive. So say New York is fine, even if you're gonna be in New Jersey. Um, and generally older content is fine because uh, the core of these courses doesn't change much over time. Um, the exceptions to that are 
con law and Civ Pro, but what can you do? So these guides tell you what the law is. A lot of the time, Gilbert's and Emanuel's is keyed to the most common case books that you're going to read. So don't, don't do these things. Don't reread or write brief cases or talk till you drop. Really use uh, these commercial outlines as guides to obtain a quick understanding of cases. Now, this is something that professors tend to dissuade students from doing. I have my own theories about why that is. Um, and I've written a long article about it in Above the Law called Rainbow Vomit. Uh, just Google Rainbow Vomit and Larry Law Law and Above the Law and you'll find it. There's a longer and kind of filthier version on my own website, so whichever one you want to read. Um, but basically, I think it's a misdiagnosis of how, it's a misunderstanding of how outlines should be used. A lot of the time, professors can really see on an exam when a student hasn't done their work during the semester and just frantically buys one of those outlines and regurgitates what's on them. Um, that's not what these outlines are for. So there's a question from Mark, by the outlines that your professors have written themselves. Um, well, okay, let me, let me address that. That really rarely happens. Emanuel's are, and Gilbert's are written by kind of a staff at those companies. They are not written by professors. There are horn books um, that are written by professors that purport to be more of a textbook rather than a case book. I would not use those. They tend to be way too detailed to help you. The one exception to that is uh, the explainers and um, examples and explanations. Glennon on civil procedure is a great book. He is a professor, um, but whoever you are, I would get that. I hope, Mark, does that, does that help? I'm, I'm almost done with the fixed stuff, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to that in a minute. Okay. Um, so use these products, um, and you don't have to just use the ones. I, I, I'm, I'm aware that there are other products. These are the ones I like. Whatever works for you uh, that helps you shortcut getting an understanding of the law, use those. Okay, so I mean, this is my anecdotal proof of this. I really, I just got this honestly totally unsolicited email five days ago. Uh, here's a testimonial. I'm currently second in my class at Vanderbilt. Um, this is C. And really do owe it to your emphasis on practice exams and hypos. I didn't brief past the second week of school like you recommended, just read once through, took boat notes in the margins and relied on 2L's outlines to get me through class. Um, if you really, scraping to save money. I, I, I don't recommend that you skimp on buying whatever tools that you need to do well your first year. Um, but you can also use outlines from upperclassmen. Um, that's fine. Um, but that really helped uh, see here. Uh, more proof is this other person who went to uh, Hastings, um, just finished my first semester of law school, straight A's across the board and an A plus in torts. You reiterated time and time again not to worry about how the other students were studying, not to waste my time combing over every single word in my casebook. Now, this guy was honest because, I mean, he's actually here explaining, um, guy or girl, um, I actually don't know. Um, I must admit I did feel a little off and behind students who could recite verse from our casebook. In short, I didn't feel as smart as the guy next to me who would quote a line from a certain page and then have a back and forth with the professor. But hey, that guy can go kick rocks because your method is really what works in law school. Um, so again, this is, this is anecdotal, uh, but I have lots of students who followed this method. They have not followed the path of boxer from animal farm and working themselves to death doing the wrong things. 
So let me, let me totally open it up. Um, any other questions that people might have? So here's a question from, from Mike. Um, when we are going over cases in class, what exactly are we trying to pay attention to in terms of the professor's view? Also, is there any chance of them changing, altering the black letter law to their own view or how it should be? So let me, let me, let me untangle the two different questions there. And Mike, if you want to unmute yourself, we can have a, we can totally have a back and forth on this. Um, or if you want to, you know, unmask yourself video wise too, that's fine. Mike, you on? Yeah. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? All right. So why don't we go over the first? Um, let me go. Let me go over the second question first. Is there any chance of them changing, altering the black letter law to their own view? Um, yes. I mean, I, I, you know, it's not necessarily changing the black letter law. Um, some of it is wording. Um, have I given you my whole Leningrad drunk spiel? Um, yeah, I was it. Okay, okay. I'll do the fast version of this. Um, my Krim Pro professor had a very specific way he wanted you to refer to intoxication um, as a defense to specific intent crimes. So uh, he didn't want you to say intoxicated at the point of negating specific intent. Um, it, he described a blackout episode that he had as a student at Oxford when he went to visit the Soviet Union in the 60s, crawling on Nevsky Prospect after drinking a bottle of vodka. So he said, always call that Leningrad drunk or even just LD. Um, so you use the professor's terminology. Um, there's, a, there's a more subtle thing here where the professor, um, especially if he's teaching a 1L subject that he likes, a lot of professors are just forced to teach 1L subjects, so they don't really love them. But like con law professors, sometimes contracts professors who are kind of law and econ types, they love to talk theory um, and, you know, how cases kind of should be. Um, in really rare instances, you should follow them down those rabbit holes. But whatever the professor says the law is, the law kind of is. Maybe that's the easy way to put it. You, you shouldn't be in a position where you're arguing uh, what the content of the law is. Contracts and kind of law and econ type professors are the only exception to that. They, they seem to want to hear a lot about, uh, for instance, efficient breach. Um, uh, and that's not really found in the case law. I mean, we can, we can talk more about that as that comes up, but for nearly anything else, um, whatever the professor's pet theories are in class, they're going to come back to the black letter law on the exam. And it, a lot of the times it's a huge, uh, it's, it's jarring because sometimes they'll get really like way steep in theory and super interesting things in class. And then it's a shock that the exam is not full of policy. It's just a straight up issue spotter. All right. Uh, that's your second question, Mike. Let me get to the first. Um, what exactly are we trying to pay attention to in terms of the professor's view? Um, I think there's a lot of subtle things uh, to read um, with your professor. Um, styles of argumentation that they like, whether they like counterintuitive arguments, um, whether they think their pet theories are important. Um, it, it's not, I can't just, there's, there's not, Mm -hmm. They're kind of guidelines I can give you, and it's things like that. Um, but between that and maybe taking a glance at the very beginning of the semester at your professor's exams, if they offer them online, um, you don't want to take them, but you can at least glance at them as a hint at what they're going to think is important uh, for purposes of an exam. But don't burn that exam by like taking it at the very beginning of the semester. Save that like. Uh, saving gold at the, um, you know, hoard it and only spend it at the very end of the semester when you're kind of getting into the mode where you're locked into your professor's mindset. Um, uh, does that work, Mike? Happy to, yeah. give me yeah. follow-ups if that's not super clear. 
I was, I was wondering, wondering so, so, like, during the cases, there might be, like, a random fact pattern, and maybe the professor doesn't actually agree with how the whole thing, would that matter? Um, it might, but you have to listen to the context. Mm -hmm. um, is it their opinion, or are they just doing the kind of Socratic uh, oh, devil's advocate thing? I mean... They could have a student whose view is totally their own. I mean, even politically, say, on a con law case, but they're still going to make you make that student go through the whole stupid freeform jazz odyssey thing. The song doesn't end, uh, uh, so they'll, they'll kind of grill, but you have to be alert to that. Um, but uh, what I think, you know, to me, um, one of the keys is to, to perk up when you hear suppose or what if we changed this fact? You know, they're not just grilling on the facts themselves, but they're getting into hypos as variants of the case that's before you. I think my ears would really perk up and I'd write that down. And okay. specifically, that, I mean, and this requires you to watch the professor. It's you hear the student's answer, which may or may not be garbage. Um, the, the problem is when you don't know what's important, I mean, everyone, you know, I had friends who would just like, they just typed everything verbatim. You can do that, but that, that's not very discerning. I mean, you're, you're actually, you know, the professor's a human being um, and they're trying to be nice to students, but you can tell if a professor finds something interesting that the student said or thinks it's garbage. So you, you know, especially in the context of a, of a professor offering a hypo, you want to be super alert to that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, cool, cool. Okay, uh, Kyle says, uh, what do you think of getting to maybe worth it? Should I read it during the semester? And then separately, what is a typical day look like in your view? Uh, Kyle, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying. Oh, hey, Nicole. Sorry, I, I've taken a while to get back to you on this. So okay. yeah. why, why don't I get back to you now? This is what I think of getting to maybe. Um, I tend to think of professors as, I mean, a lot of my friends have become law professors. And they're obsessed with theory, really beautiful theory. And, and they, look, they kind of look down on practice. So this was, you know, it's a book written by professors. I, I've read it. Um, I find it super interesting. I have yet to have a student who was able to apply what was there. So for those of you who don't know, Getting to Maybe is an interesting book written by a couple of professors about how to do well on law exams. Uh, the problem is read, you know, look at the cover, look at, look at the reviews that are, that are given by it. I don't see a single student saying, I read this and got straight A's because of it. It's like plaudits that they receive from other professors, like, this is marvelous. I wish my students would use this. So there's something to it about how professors think, but whether it's helpful on an exam, um, I've, had, I've had students for years, some of my first students, they read it and they just had a hard time applying it. Um, it's kind of a long book at that. That's why I, I almost feel like, feel like it, would it would be more useful a couple of months, months in, in rather than reading it now. I'm sure exactly what they're talking about. I, I think one of the hard things is, and it's, it's one of the central problems with law school, is that everything is about the final exam. I mean, that's the ball that's kind of openly hidden by professors. So getting to maybe, I think, might be worth something once you have a bunch of hypos or exams under your belt. But the vast majority of students don't get there until late November or early December. Mm -hmm. So they read it and they're like, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. And then they kind of, they get through the semester and they forget about it. They don't come back to it. Um, and, and then, you know, the lessons of getting to maybe aren't really available to them, to them by the time they actually get to reviewing um, exams. Right. So uh, I have mixed feelings about it. I mean, okay. if, if you're, you know, if you guys are really on top of, uh, on top of your work, if you're kind of getting a couple of practice, at least, you know, several practice exams a week, 
then when you're kind of mid semester and you have a weekend, you know, give it a flip and see if it helps you. But you know, the key, the, the, the key thing that it kind of brought to the world is this idea of forks in the law and forks in the facts. I mean, I think that kind of central idea is interesting that in designing exams, professors are, are, are consciously coming up with points where the law conflicts or where there are conflicting interpretations of the facts. They're not trying to leave Easter eggs like that. Just say, hey, you know, Hawkins versus McGee. Uh, it's not shout outs to cases. It, it, it's the creation of conflicts that you have to resolve. I think that's, you know, that'll get you half, <laughs> half of, of getting to maybe is right. understanding that that's the correct way to think about about a law school exam. And then what should a typical day look like in your view? Um, half an hour or an hour a day of taking a practice exam, some pre-studying of the law, then actually reading the cases, or if you wanna reverse those two, to try to get whatever it is that professors think you get out of kind of muddling through a case on your own. You can read the case and then read the outline um, and then you go to class. Awesome. That's exactly, That's exactly what I was thinking. thinking. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, Mary is up. Um, I'll read the question, and then if you want to do it back and forth. When using these outlines, is one really getting the gist within the class, torts? Will the professor expect more in the class from the student? Um, and are the use of 1L or 2L outlines recommended? So, uh, Mary, you on? Do you want to unmute yourself and kind of talk this out? Um, if you're having problems unmuting, let me see. Okay, okay, I'll um, I'll, I'll I'll talk through. Okay, let me start uh, with your second questions. Are the use of one L or two L outlines recommended? Um, I think they're fine. Um, and in fact, I think, uh, remember that I put out the video about the use of commercial outlines versus making your own outlines. Um, if you grab a 1L or 2L outline, there are kind of a couple benefits. One is they're often written in Microsoft Word. Um, so you can actually build your own outline off of an existing 1L or 2L outline. I think there's no shame in using them to study as long as you more or less are willing to understand that, you know, a particular student might be wrong about a particular part of the law. But it's gonna be, I mean, people kind of, one thing that I've noticed about law students is they tend to make the perfect the enemy of the good. Excuse me. Um, uh, you know, the law might be wrong or a commercial outline might not be exactly how a professor would do, but like, um, it's like 90% of the way there. I mean, even just a halfway competent 1L or 2L has put a decent outline together. Like it's mostly there. So you can totally use those to study if you have access at this early stage to like a student bar exam. So, sorry, student bar association often makes these uh, outlines available or, uh, uh, or whatever. Uh, going back, um, Mary, I wish you could follow up on I'm not entirely, I think I understand what you mean by your earlier question. So let me, when using these outlines, is one really getting the gist within the class, like torts? Will the professor expect more in the class from the students? I kind of read those as two different questions, and let me try and answer them, and then you, you tell me if I kind of got to where you want. Um, when using these outlines, is one really getting the gist within the class? Okay, I, honestly, I still have problems with that question. I, I think what you're getting at is, is it enough to talk about the class? Yes, semi-competently. I mean, let me, be, let me be really honest. Will you be able to answer the question like someone, answer a professor's questions like someone who's read the case frantically five times the night before? Absolutely not. Don't, don't kid yourself. What you're doing is just trying to get by in class. Now, remember that it, for any one case or for any one time being on call, um, uh, that sounds like a trade-off worth, worth making. You, you don't want to sound stupid. 
Uh, so you're going to spend, you're going to read the case like five times. Uh, the problem is like over the course of the semester, you prepare like that for every case. It's not necessary for the final exam. It crowds out the other important activities that you should be engaging in, namely taking hypos and taking practice exams. Uh, and then, uh, as it turns out, the way you've participated in class isn't what matters, it's how you did on the exam. Um, so is, is the outline really important to, to getting the gist? I, I, I don't know. The other way I've read your question is like, um, are you really getting the gist in, in class? The answer is sometimes maybe. Not every professor does a pure Socratic method. I mean, some professors will do a little bit of lecture. Um, so one thing to note is you really want to pay attention. A lot of the time, a professor doesn't manage time well, lets students go on and on and on in class, and then the last five minutes realizes that nobody kind of figured out what they wanted, so they'll kind of really quickly lecture on what they thought the cases were about. Really pay super attention, really close attention. Don't close up your book bag. Stay to the end. Uh, really be hyper alert at the end. Um, uh, but that's not always what happens. The professors that are more purely Socratic method may never explain to you exactly what the black letter law is uh, that, that, that's supposed to come from a case, okay? Um, okay, Mary says, using the manuals as an example versus reading the, the case book for class. So remember that I don't suggest it as a replacement. I mean, I don't say don't read the cases. I, maybe I should have made that super clear. I'm saying like read them once and read them the night before and not more than that. Um, if you have a couple, if you're really going to be disciplined, uh, you, you just don't keep reading it until you feel like you understand it. I mean, your sense that you understand it is a very subjective thing. You might feel better about yourself, but I don't know that you can trust your feelings especially when you're not given other feedback on what it means to be kind of uh, doing well in terms of something, in terms of eventually getting a good out, outcome on your exams, okay? So don't, don't skip the reading. Use the manuals to kind of either allow you to skim the case or uh, to get a better understanding of the case faster so that you just kind of move on, okay? And I've got an ah, okay, from Mary. Great, great. Uh, from Chloe, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself so we can go back and forth. While, while you decide that, I'll read your question. How do we know whether the outlines we get from 2Ls are good enough to rely on? Um, you don't. Uh, the thing is, um, what you can do is compare outlines and pick the one that's kind of... Um, uh, maybe more comprehensive. Let me, let me be super clear. Um, outlines for studying, you're kind of better off with somewhat longer outlines. Now, with an Emanuel's or Gilbert's, those things are 200, 300 pages, but that's not what you're kind of pre-studying. There's a short capsule outline in the front that is more than sufficient for your purposes. It tends to run 30 to 50 pages. A good outline really boils things down to, to their essence. Um, so there's like the scene in the paper chase where a guy who keeps calling everyone else a pimp, he's in uh, Tim Bottoms' study group. He has like this 500-page outline. And he, for some reason, when Tim walks out, Tim Bottoms, I, I don't even remember his actual, Mr. Hart, uh, walks out of the study group. Uh, the guy is on the second story of a building at Harvard and he accidentally throws his stupid outline out the window. You do not want to have a 500-page outline. That is not what makes it good. Uh, what makes an outline good is clarity and just really crystallizing cases down to their essence. Um, but if you have outlines available to you, Chloe, um, look at a couple of them. Pick the one that's a little bit more complete because you're using it to kind of study. And then when you make your own outline, make sure that yours is shorter than that. Okay? I, I hope that helps. Um, any other questions? Any other questions at all?
Um, I'm going to hang on for just a couple minutes more uh, in case you, you have questions. I'll wait for text or anyone can kind of unmute themselves and jump in. Now that you can see my mug. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the recording here, and 